The Book of Recollections, Episode 6, Atonement, by Dysylvania. My dear audience is back. Yes, finally the story can go on. It must go on. I need to know what happened next. For I am the Book of Recollections, speaking in your favorite voice. So lay back, relax, and let the story unfold like the darkness that unfurled around Gregory. Remember Gregory? He was attacked by the world snake last time we saw him. Now shush, the story begins. For the first time in forever, his bones and muscles did not ache. His belly did not gurgle of hunger. Lost in this vast expanse of nothingness, the only sound he could hear was the gentle flow of water. Gregory opened his eyes. He was on a boat, aimlessly drifting on a dark river. He stood up and saw another boat approaching. Squinting, he saw the silhouette of a figure dressed in brown robes. The two boats neared until they gently made contact. In the other boat stood Lucius, the betrayer, the one that left them behind within the Cronus Sanctum, though the man who stood in front of him looked different much older than he remembered, dressed in the same brown robes he wore when he first entered Greenwell. Not quite the kingly garment one would expect of the founder of Greenspring, is it? Lucius greeted him like an old friend, but Gregory was suspicious of his presence there. This could be yet another machination devised by someone or something. Yet, after touching both the boat and Lucius' face, and only after the man reassured him that some strings had to be pulled in order for both of them to meet, Gregory's guard began to slowly fold. Lucius talked about the remorse he felt after they got teleported out of the tomb, and how the face of his friend haunted his nights. Lucius didn't ask for forgiveness, knowing that he did not deserve it, but all he desired was to put things into perspective and allow Gregory to go on in peace, knowing that his sacrifice was worth it in the end. Lucius told the man that all he had tried to do was to give humanity the means of defending themselves, the means of no longer living in fear. Gregory found out that, after vanishing from the Tomb of Time and appearing back in Greenwell, Lucius let Yarek go, because he was nothing more than a casualty in a battle he had nothing to do with. The guilt of taking the poor Ravenfolk hostage weighed heavily on Lucius' soul, and thinking back on how Gregory offered him a helping hand when entering Greenwell, Lucius had extended his towards everyone else, no matter their race or belief. But his attempts at doing better were thwarted by the appearance of a shade, a cloaked creature that haunted his every waking moment ever since he stole the Book of Vim, whilst his dreams were disturbed by Gregory's disappointed look. Lucius told his story and Gregory asked about his siblings, to which the man in brown robes replied that his shame pushed him to offer them a luxurious life, but too afraid, he never told the two what actually happened to Gregory. As the revelations hit Gregory, softening his still stern look, a boat made of tarnished gold appeared over the horizon and began to drift in their direction. As the boat reached the two men, they saw it was sailed by a figure covered in tattered robes, which extended a hand. At the sight of this entity, Lucius reached down and for the first time, Gregory saw that upon his friend's boat there were many offerings chief among them coins bearing the face of Saturni, all the while Gregory's boat was empty. Lucius offered him a fistful of coins, urging him to take them, but the man refused. The cloaked figure extended his hands towards the two, demanding payment for passage. Gregory asked if he wouldn't be able to wait another day, but the figure shrugged, reiterating the words. Lucius ended up paying for both of them, they began drifting away as the men found themselves on the same boat, 
facing each other. Gregory asked Lucius about the rumors regarding him and his sister, Alea. With a smile on his face, Lucius explained that his trips to Gregory's siblings drew the attention of everyone, so rumors spread. Fearing that his forbidden relationship with Martius would have been exposed, he perpetuated them. He pointed to the fact that Alea was pregnant at the time. Time went by and Lucius's mental health began to deteriorate. He instituted the Meritronarchy, in which both bloodline and merit would be the de facto way in which one could become king. To his surprise, Alea's granddaughter was one of the competitors and Lucius himself offered the necessary credentials for her acceptance in the trials. With a cracked voice, Lucius added that the true rulers of the kingdom were and always will be Gregory's bloodline. Lucius asked Gregory what he thought of Greenspring, to which the man replied that, although an improvement, if given the opportunity, he would have fought for the other side, because non-humans were being oppressed. Lucius's eyes filled with sorrow. Silence crept over the boat and they reached a flat surface. The two realized that other boats drifted all around them, each carrying people to the same destination. Looking around, Gregory recognized some of them as the civilians who died during the terrorist attack in the marketplace. Amongst them, the small girl with golden ponytails, hugging the small rooster. They reached the end of the world, witnessing before them the ever-changing cosmic waves of the astral sea, and, with the sound of falling coins, a gate manifested beneath them. Their essence felt as though being turned upside down and that the only thing that kept them in place was the boat itself. The landscape was a strange kaleidoscope of black and white shades and shapes. The boat continued adrift towards a gargantuan beam of energy, radiating from the center of this vista. The two friends shook hands and Gregory thanked Lucius for what he had done, and that, although a few days for Gregory, his friend's suffering lasted longer than anyone could have imagined. Lucius's vision turned webbed. As the two held hands, their bodies were vaporized by the beam of energy. In those final moments, Lucius closed his eyes and he allowed himself to taste the sweet feeling of peace, whilst Gregory gave thanks to the serpent that ended him and with the hope of ever returning to the world extinguished, so did he. But, as the impossibly bright beam of energy engulfs our surroundings, we are cast outside of this place as our perspective shifts back to the Silent Bay Tavern, for our story is not over yet. The first hours of dawn crept in over Greenspring, ushering in a new day. Genevieve woke up and rushed towards the kitchen where, as promised, she began to prepare the breakfast, her famous Coco Sang. Kate woke up from a nightmare. In it, she saw Yarek running through the woods, being chased by the Beastman clan before being cut down by Shaklashak. Ah, dreams. Cryptic messages from beyond. Especially on the day of Lunai. But can one really trust them? She jumped out of her comfortable bed, checked on her hair that was already beginning to grow back, and joined her friends for breakfast. As they talked over the breakfast table, their attention was drawn to Shifty, who was carrying the body of a squirrel with an amputated tail. The tiny blob entered the tavern, gently placing the wounded animal on the table. The group was surprised that Gregory was not with him. Keith and Genevieve asked Shifty what had happened, and the body of the small blob morphed itself into various shapes, painting the picture of Gregory and Shaq heading in the direction of a tree, and how the former wished for Shifty to return with the squirrel. At the sight of the blob, Adam was taken aback. This entity was of Sabbath and, after the two explained the blob's story, Adam felt more at ease in the presence of it. Jen, realizing that Keith hadn't eaten, rushed into the kitchen, while Pax made his way to their table and healed the injured squirrel. Jen returned, plate of omelette in hand, and realized that now Pax had nothing to eat. Back to the kitchen with Jen, while the group 
kept asking questions about Gregory's and Shaq's whereabouts. Shifty left them for a few moments, going upstairs only to return with a note, which explained that the two needed a couple of days to take care of an important matter. The letter was nothing if not suspicious, but they decided not to panic and to continue about their day. Bellies full, the group mapped out their schedule. The first thing on their agenda was finding Bob in order to repay the debt they owed to Monkey. And since Adam knew both the man and his location, it was more than advantageous. From there, they would head over to the library in order to find out the history of the last four centuries. Afterwards, Adam would leave them for a few hours because an exam awaited him at the university. The group took to the streets, passing the Woodfair River in the direction of the Commerce Center, ground zero of yesterday's attack, if you weren't paying attention, whose usually crowded streets were eerily quiet. With Adam in front, they quickly arrived at Bob's. Inside the shop, Bob, a stuttery individual, greeted them. The group explained the reason they sought Bob out, and the man pulled from beneath the counter a sheathed sword, handing it to Keith. From there, they made their way to Monkey's last known location, but, to their surprise, the building was no longer in the Jovis district. Rolling his eyes, Pax used magical correspondence to find Monkey's new location. The four journeyed towards the hillside district, home of Martis. Their trip was blocked by a mob that was carrying banners and protesting against the diurnals and the ancestral light associating them with a terrorist group known as the Flame. In their midst, they saw Persephone, who was being attacked by the rioters. Enraged, but still diplomatic, Pax rushed to her aid, ordering the people to cease their actions. Taken aback by the power in his words and the sparks that emanated from his body, the mob dispersed. Pax turned and tended to a now crying Persephone, whose groceries were lying on the cobblestone. After receiving a heartfelt hug from the half-elf, she put aside the dark thoughts and headed back to her establishment. Arriving in the hillside district, their eyes were assaulted by brutalist buildings bearing the red mark of the hebdomads and, after a few minutes of wandering about the streets, they found themselves outside of Monkey's enterprise. Um, yeah, a bit awkward to see Monkey holding such a sword. And annoying. Please. Shit that sword up. With their monkey business out of the way, but with the promise of more dealings in the future, the group began to make their way to the Sabbath History Library. In the Midnight District, the group discovered another protest, this time against wild magic. Due to the high number of people in attendance, guards were making their way through the crowd and, as the law dictated, ordered them to extend one hand, which they then pricked with a magical needle. The guardsmen approached our time travelers in order to do their duty, but upon seeing Adam's and Pax's credentials, they stepped back and allowed them passage without testing their blood. From there, they passed through the Sunrise District, whose sublime buildings radiated the light of its hebdomad's heritage, and finally, they made their way to the Augury District. While the midnight buildings evoked an ephemeral beauty, and the sunrise one's opulence and sturdiness, the district of Sabbath invoked the solemnity and the eeriness of the grave. Even the buildings had muted colors. As they made their way to the library, they saw the guards standing vigil along the length of the Sabbath river and the grand chapel, dwarfed by a massive tower taller than any other building in Greenspring, the dead man's tower. The two Greenspring natives led them along Historian Street, which had people dressed in storytellers' garments. Uh, weren't they present during the combat that took place in the marketplace and wasn't one of them also following Gregory and Shaklashak? Hmm, curious. Perplexed by their unusual attire, Genevieve inquired about them and Pax explained that those people were historians. Upon taking a closer look at both the Sabbath River and its guards, Keith and Genevieve tried to understand what would happen if one were to jump into the water, but Adam found it rather difficult to come up with a straight answer. 
seeing how the presence of Shifty left him wondering the same thing. Within the halls of the library, the group was met by a storyteller, who offered their assistance, but they used no words as those storytellers could communicate telepathically. Pax and Adam described the books they wanted to find, and the individual was more than happy to help, but in order to cover more ground, the group split. Adam and Keith went to find the documentation regarding her people, whilst Pax and Genevieve went towards the section that detailed what happened to Valboa. The book which detailed shifters, which is the modern polite name for half-breeds or mongrels, offered a more anatomical view of the race. Their continuous search led them to the Dead People Library, where she began to search for any of her friends. One name, however, carried more weight than any other. Floki, Yarek's father and chieftain of the Corvus clan. The document described how the chieftain was welcomed by King Lucius, who allowed him to practice his faith, but, although fights broke out between the Order of the Hebdomads and the Corvus clan, Lucius was always by Floki's side. At the end of the document, he read about how Yarek fled in the fourth year in the Age of the Loom, on a personal quest from which he never returned. The document proved somewhat useful in allowing Keith to discern the possible location of where her tribe used to reside, which was known as Venoris, or Lang's district. On the other hand, Pax and Genevieve had better luck in their search for Valbois and the Lafevre family. The book told of how Greenspring came to be, and how everything around it was engulfed by the city, including Valboa, alongside the shrine of the Church of Enduring and the settlements around it. Furthermore, while searching for any trace of the Lafevre family, she found a book that detailed the dead members and, to her surprise, her parents weren't on it. However, her cousin Pierre was on the list, seemingly dying for his convictions. They regrouped outside the library's walls and, after Adam parted ways with them, they decided to visit the Firefly pub in the Midnight District, where they would discuss their findings. Their first stop was the Lungs District, where they were welcomed by the smell of nature. The streets leading to the place where Keith hoped to find more answers were filled with gardens and the group realized that the majority of the population were women, who were also the de facto guards. Passing the botanical gardens by way of the Halria Bridge, Keith and Jen saw a strange painting adorning the biggest rock in the park, a painting washed by the passage of time which resembled Keith. The surprise of the painting emboldened Keith and made her understand that she will find resolution. Walking through the streets, the smell of the trees and flowers alongside the sound of the river was exactly the same as Keith remembered. And, after asking a few questions from a grouchy elf regarding the painting, they found out that it was done way before he was born. This revelation prompted Pax to message Grace in order to elucidate the mystery surrounding whether or not Yarek is dead. Heading back to the Ogre district, the group entered the orphanage, where Grace lived. Within its walls, children fought amongst themselves and learned the ways of trickery, as they pulled on the heartstrings of Genevieve who almost got caught in their trap. But both her purse and her future were saved by Grace, who ordered the children to get away from the group. Grace took some time to explain how contacting the dead worked and asked for Keith's permission to gaze into her mind, in order to know what Yarek looked like. Grace pointed out the fact that either Yarek might not be dead or that he doesn't look the same. Furthermore, she told them stories of people who might be able to live for a long time without employing the need of gods or magic, some calling them immortals. Seeing this unfold, Jen asked Grace to do the same for her, and the girl accepted. The result was the same. The liquid was unable to form the faces of Jen's parents, but she found out that Jen's father was terribly ill. They headed towards the Midnight District and found Jen's restaurant which, to her surprise, was still standing, even if the passage of time hadn't been kind to it. Within the once lavish walls, the Dampir met her old friend Hugo, and after giving him a big hug, he told Jen everything that had happened. After her disappearance, he was appointed chef by Mr. Fang, but because he had no hunting skills and no knowledge on how to cook meat like Jen, the menu turned vegan, 
which in turn attracted customers that preferred the vegan diet. Hugo told Jen of her parents that relocated to Nocturna Obscura. Pax messaged his father who lived in Obscura asking him if he might have any information regarding the Lafevres. Our protagonists might enjoy a bit of respite, but the story takes us to another location within the Midnight District. We pass through the streets and alleyways of the Midnight District, following a new individual, mysterious, tall and cloaked. He entered a dilapidated building where a man with dark hair and piercing eyes awaited. The man's body was adorned by religious tattoos. One such tattoo it was the symbol of Lumino, cut by the presence of another symbol, a circle of flame. He was sitting casually, with his legs upon the desk. Behind him, the banner of the front of liberation and ascension of mankind through embers. Is... Is that the same individual the group saw a day before in the mirror? Three things were made known that night. First was the fact that the individual we've been following into the building was the Chancellor. Second, both him and the flame had the same goal. To renounce magic, go back to the true gods and see the city burn. Thirdly, the conversation was being followed by someone whose eyes were white and had a peculiar discoloration in form of a butterfly mask on her face. Grace? And after learning all of those secrets, that someone ran away. This was the recap for episode 6 of Vim as told by the Book of Recollections. I'm Lermiloshan, your recap narrator. If you'd like to follow our Dungeons & Dragons campaign, Vim, the Tale of Immortality, Tune in Sundays at 0500 UTC, youtube.com slash at Dysylvania. New recaps drop every Friday evening. Thanks for sticking with us and remember, every subscriber keeps the magic going. Good day, good night, and don't let the vampires bite.